father yeah. thank you lord thank you jesus for being with us in every time and in every situation every case and uh, jesus please be with us till uh, end of the class and uh, help us to know more about you and your word through through the pastor deepak samuel garu and uh, and please give strength to to be whole in faith with you till the end of our lives in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you so much brother yeah um we can okay some indication on my screen that i do not understand um okay volume is low is it uh i'll see what i can do uh can most of you hear me loud and clear okay that's good then uh yeah if most of you can hear then um, maybe there's nothing wrong you know with my laptop here which is a good thing um oh perfect thank you so much yeah okay so everyone is able to hear now that's excellent so uh yeah i had uh, gone away for four days on a mission trip so yesterday i was not in a position to take a class uh, which is why we had to you know miss out on uh, yesterday's class uh, but then last night i was able to get back so uh, today we are back on schedule um so um we did the historical books um kings and chronicles uh, and uh, we are continuing with the history uh, so today we have ezra then next week we would be doing nehemiah so uh, this is a continuation of the history of israel all the things that they went through as a people uh, and uh, now of course in ezra and nehemiah we see them coming back to the land and we see some of the events that take place even as they uh, return back here uh, so um, anyone has any questions you know they can uh, because we are doing this online everyone is online today we can either raise a hand and if i see that on my screen you know i can pause and you can ask your question uh, or um, you can uh, type in the chat because i can see that it's, it's in front of my eyes i will be able to see whatever you post there okay so any time during the class you are free to raise any questions um oh yeah yeah the trip was good um i'm not sure if i'm supposed to discuss uh, you know um details online um, because some some of our christian community live in different difficult circumstances uh, so better not to discuss those things you know here uh, but yes it's a wonderful thing to see the way god is working um, you know among people who don't have the freedom and the privileges we do but it's so lovely to see the hand of god at work yes um yeah so moving on with our class um yes so uh, ezra and nehemiah are uh, covering events that take place after the uh, jews return back home um and um, in the hebrew old testament uh, where you have a different ordering you know they they ordered the order of the books in a slightly different manner so they have daniel and then uh, that is followed by ezra and nehemiah and then at the end you have chronicles that's the order in which the hebrew people they placed their uh, old testament books so this is like almost at the end uh, after the book of daniel where you know daniel is fasting and praying and saying lord you promised we would go back so now you begin to start doing the events lord which will help us to return back to our land so immediately after that uh, you have this story of uh, ezra and nehemiah being recorded in their hebrew order of books uh, where it um, where, the, where we see that prayer of daniel being fulfilled and now the people are coming back and then in the end you have chronicles which is like kind of you know wrapping up all of their history giving the genealogies uh, talking about uh, the kings who were faithful to the lord and the ones who strayed away and all of that so the uh, chronicles becomes like a summary of their entire history and then you have that long period of silence 
um, you know, which starts uh, where the Lord is no longer speaking through any prophet because the people have hardened their hearts, but uh, there is still hope because he knows that one day a voice in the wilderness will rise again and that voice will start preparing the way for the people uh, to start coming back to God. Uh, so, uh, so at the end of the silence, you again uh, have an account which begins with a genealogy and you have uh, the Messiah's genealogy being presented. So there's a kind of connection between Chronicles and uh, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. So um, this is the ordering in which they had placed their books. So they concluded with Chronicles and they had Ezra and Nehemiah coming just before that, um, before Chronicles. Uh, something that we would need to know regarding this uh, whole Babylonian invasion, uh, as we know, it was in uh, 539 BC that uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he he takes away the first group of Jews, and then there's a second, uh, you know, second invasion, and then in the third invasion, um, even the few people who are left, most of them get taken away. Uh, so at that time, the Babylonian Empire considered themselves at the top of their power, and uh, they were very uh, proud. Uh, they thought that they would never ever be, you know, vanquished. Uh, but then, if you look at, uh, you know, later on when we start looking at the prophetic books. Uh, something appeared on my screen and went okay as long as I'm audible no. yeah so um what was I saying I just lost my train of thought um yeah the Babylonians they felt that they had you know conquered everything all the kingdoms that are there uh, but then when we go on to look at the prophetic books which we will be seeing there again and again God so clearly says you're all instruments that I am using. To bring judgment to certain you know peoples whenever i want according to my timing so uh, even though you nations think that you are great uh, when your time comes you also will face judgment right now i'm using you as an instrument to bring judgment but uh, uh, later you yourself will be judged when the time comes so we see that uh, 66 years after the first group of Jews, Jews get taken away captive to Babylon, 66 years after that, the Babylonian Empire itself crashes uh, because that is when you have the um, Persian king coming and conquering them. So he takes over that entire empire. Babylon, uh, the Babylonians are left with nothing. And uh, it's the Persians who take over take over all of the regions which were earlier under the control of the Babylonians. And as we all know, Cyrus, uh, God moves the heart of Cyrus, it says in Second Chronicles, so that he comes up with a new international policy that had never been practiced before. And he decides, I'm going to allow all these captives to return back to their lands. And God moves his heart to such an extent that not only does he give permission to this Jewish people to return, he even returns back all the gold that had been stolen from the temple. So he says, even as you're going back and you're going to be rebuilding your city and rebuilding your temple, here are the resources which were taken away by the Babylonian king. Now you can take them back and you can use them for you know the construction of your temple. So he, because God moves the heart of this emperor, uh, the Jewish people find great favor uh, you know, in the eyes of the king. Uh, coming just quickly to some uh, technical details, uh, the genre of the book of Ezra, of course, it's narrative history. But then again, here you have some genealogies which are mentioned. Um, author, almost everyone agrees that it is Ezra who would have written it. Um, and um, um, he kind of is compiling events which took place. Uh, you know, in Ezra and Nehemiah, you have events covering a time period of almost 100 years, around 90 to 95 years, uh, um, events which took place over that long time period are covered in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, so language, um, you know, if you remember in our first introductory class, we talked about how there are some Old Testament books uh, where you have Aramaic being mentioned. Um, along with Hebrew. So Ezra is one of those places where you have a lot of Aramaic mentioned simply because uh, wherever they talk about all these letters which were exchanged between the emperor and the local people, uh, 
so they would send an, uh, a letter to the king and it would be written in Aramaic and then the king would reply back to the people uh, who are living over here in this region and that also would be written in Aramaic. So left they, I, they basically left those original letters in the original language. They didn't translate them into Hebrew when they were recording them in their you know, scrolls. So, which is why we seem to have a lot of Aramaic happening, uh, especially Ezra chapter 4, verse 18. From there onwards up to chapter 6, verse 18, all the letters and the decrees of the king uh, regarding the temple and all of that, those things are written in the Aramaic language rather than Hebrew. And these two are very, like, they're like sister languages, very similar to each other. Uh, even the script also is... Um, identical you know not identical but uh, extremely similar uh, key personalities that we find in the book of ezra you have uh, cyrus ezra haggai zechariah um, and yeah, a few other people uh, we look at the structure of the book uh, the first three chapters ezra chapter one to three is where you have the people returning back uh, in your um, in your textbook, you have a couple of tables uh, which are talking about these things. Uh, so I'm just kind of summing up, you know, um, and uh, showing how the book of Ezra is structured and exactly what event took place at what time. Uh, so, you know, that would kind of give you a clear timeline. So um, it's not mentioned exactly in that manner in your textbook, but you do have all the necessary details over there. OK, so. Um, Ezra chapter 1 uh, to chapter 3 uh, talks about the, um, the return. And so over here in these three chapters, basically what is happening is you have 50,000 uh, Jews only returning back. They are coming back in 538 BC and they are being led by a newly appointed governor. So when Cyrus is sending them back, he says, see, I have appointed one of you as your new governor. So when you go back to your land, he will be the one governing uh, your entire region. So he will be under my authority. So, you know, there are this um, governor, Zerubbabel, he will still have to answer to Persia because after all, they're still under Persian control. Uh, but he will be the chief um, administrative officer when they come back. So the 50,000 Jews who are now returning back, uh, they are being led by Zerubbabel. Uh, a Jewish person, a godly person, and he is going to be their governor. And uh, the high priest who is going, is, who is coming back with them, uh, that is Joshua. Uh, and there, there are a, a couple of prophets also coming back with this first batch. Uh, one of them is Haggai. Uh, so we will be looking at a little bit of what, what Haggai says when, you, when, when we come to his prophetic book. And then there is Zechariah. So Zechariah served both as a priest and a prophet. Um, he was in that kind of a role. So these are your main personalities. Ezra in the books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, these are going to be your main uh, you know, uh, characters. They are the leaders who are leading these uh, groups. So you have Zerubbabel, the governor, Joshua, the high priest, Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, who functions both as a priest and a prophet. They come back with great passion for God. They don't delay. Uh, immediately after coming back, uh, you know, they start making preparations for the temple construction. They don't want any delay. They want to re-establish the temple and, you know, uh, claim that this land now once again belongs to Yahweh and he will be honored and worshipped in this place. So with these noble intentions, they immediately start off the uh, preparations and uh, then um, in Ezra chapter 4, it talks about events where the work of the temple comes to a standstill. So there's a lot of opposition. We look at you no know, details regarding this a little later, but right now you know, I just want to kind of give you the overall structure. So Ezra 4, you have the temple construction work uh, being stopped. Okay. In Ezra, you have the temple construction work. Uh, um, Ezra chapter 4, you have the temple construction being stopped. And um, um, this is discussed in greater detail in... Okay, we'll talk about that later. Uh, then we come to Ezra chapter 5, where you have... Um, uh, 
governor he sends a complaint one of the one of the rival governors who's in that region he stands, sends a letter to darius who is now on the throne of persia and he says to him these people are trying to create problems here and um, and so then the work is stopped for a while but then in ezra 6 um, the work is restarted so you have a lot of uh, some opposition and happening in ezra 4 5 6 finally that that gets resolved at the end of chapter 6 you have the construction of the temple being finished and this long gap actually for 20 years the temple construction work is abandoned because of the severe opposition in that region we'll talk about why that happens and all of that um then uh, we after ezra 6 uh, you have a gap of some 58 to 60 years um and then finally you come to ezra chapter 7 to 10 uh, now you have Ezra coming over here um, because up to now Ezra had not been present. It was only Zerubbabel Babel, and Joshua and all of those people who were there. But now in Ezra chapter 7 to 10, you have Ezra physically coming back over here, um, which is in 457 BC. And he comes back with just 2,000 Jews. So in one of your tables in your textbook, it talks about how um, in between the time period of Ezra 1 to 3 and Ezra chapter 4, you know, 1 to 3 is one section, Ezra 4 is another section. And in the time period between these two um, writings, that is when the book of Haggai would fit in. Okay, so, and then uh, in your table, it explains over there, Ezra, during the time of Ezra chapter 4, that is probably when this book of Zechariah would have been written because it covers events of that particular time period and then you have ezra chapter 5 and 6 as one section uh, during that time finally the construction work gets completed and then you have a long gap during which time the events of esther would have taken place esther chapter 1 to 10 and after that gets over that is when ezra physically comes back over here uh, to the land of israel and that is when you have chapters Ezra 7 to 10 and also the book of Nehemiah, which comes a little later. Uh, so there's a uh, so you would see the king who was there at that particular time and uh, um, the events which took place in one of your tables. So you see that a lot of many, many kings um, come and go, you know, on the throne of um, Persia during this time period. So it is Cyrus who gives the proclamation saying they can go back. And then after that, you have somebody named Cambyses, and he's not at all mentioned in our uh, Old Testament records. But during the time of Cambyses uh, is when Haggai writes. And um, yeah, in fact, he talks about how you know you need to restart building the temple and all of that, he says. And then during the time of this Persian king Smerdis is when um, uh, there is no construction work at all because there's a lot of opposition happening at that time. Uh, it's like 20 year gap, which, which is there. And then Darius comes to the throne. At that time, Darius kind of looks into the whole situation and then he realizes that these people, uh, the Jewish people, have a legal right to rebuild because they were given permission to do so. So at that time, finally, the work restarts. And then once the temple construction is completed, uh, you have uh, 60 years where you have Esther's story taking place in Persia. And then after that, you have um, Zeres' uh, son, uh, Atta Zeres, who's coming to the throne. And he allows Ezra to return back in 457. Later on, he allows Nehemiah to come back in 455. So kind of looking at the chart will help you to uh, understand the long periods of time which, you know, um, which pass. Uh, if you look at the book of Ezra, it's like a short little book, but actually there's a lot of time period that gets covered uh, during that. Uh, so, you, so the table will help you to see what are some of the historical, um, you know, um, uh, things that happened, which king came to the throne, which king was not there at that particular point of time. Uh, that makes it very clear. It helps. Now, Zerubbabel, um, you know, who 
comes back with the first group as the governor. Uh, he was part of the uh, messianic uh, lineage. So that's one interesting thing that you know we can keep in mind. Um, he was the uh, grandson of uh, Jeconiah. So uh, he was actually a direct descendant of David. And so it is not just coincidence that he was appointed as the governor who was returning back. Uh, God arranged circumstances in such a way that uh, Cyrus chooses to appoint somebody from the lineage of David as the one who is going to come back as governor, you know, to lead the people. Um, so uh, it's, it's Ezra chapter with the people and he serves as their uh, official governor with the approval of the Persians. And um, uh, how do we know that he is the governor? It's not mentioned over here in the book of Ezra. It's actually Haggai who mentions it in his book. Over there in the book of Haggai, Haggai mentions that Zerubbabel had been officially appointed as the governor. That's basically how we get to know. And um, Zerubbabel is um, is in yeah, uh, he's listed in your um, Matthew genealogy as well as uh, an ancestor of Jesus Christ. And uh, so there's some little confusion about Zerubbabel um, when you look in. Um, Matthew chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, it talks about someone as being Zerubbabel's father. But then when you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 19, somebody else is mentioned as Zerubbabel's father. And there's a little bit of confusion regarding who actually was the father of Zerubbabel. But there's actually a very simple explanation for that. Um, so, uh, you know, just to give a little background on that, because people pick up on these small, small things and they criticize and say, ah, look, uh, these people, uh, these writers of the Bible, they couldn't even get their genealogy straight. Uh, so, you know, it's all uh, made up story. But no, uh, these are all historical facts. And there's a reason why, uh, you know, Zerubbabel is uh, recorded in First Chronicles chapter 3, 19 as having um, Pedaya as his father, but in all the other places where it talks about him, uh, it is mentioned that his father is Shealtiel. So there's a reason why that is there, and uh, we'll just look into that very briefly. So um, from what we can gather, um, it looks like you know Shealtiel uh, would have uh, married, but maybe he died at a young age, and so he probably died without having any children okay shealtiel who is the um oldest son of um king jehoiakim okay uh, the oldest son of king jehoiakim shealtiel he dies without having any children and so according to the you know levitical laws which they had which he willing to marry the widow and the child which is born will not be known by the name of the uh, brother who is marrying. But that child who is born will carry on the name of the um, of the older son. So which is why we see that um, wherever in many of the records where Zerubbabel is mentioned, uh, his, he is identified as being the son of Shayal Tiel, even though his biological father would have been uh, the brother who married the widow. Okay, so that is why in uh, in the Matthew genealogy, where the ancestry of Jesus Christ is being traced, uh, it is mentioned that the um, father is Shayal Tiel, because according to Levit Levitical law, te technically Shayal Tiel is the father. But biologically, the person who gave birth to him would have been the next brother, who is Pedaya. Okay, so um, uh, Zerubbabel comes back with the people, and when he comes back to this land, the locals who are who have been ruling in that entire region up to now are very unhappy because this is new competition. You know, they've made their own agreements with one another. You know, all these 
governors who are in that area they have their own understandings and you know they all have their own uh, uh, territories of power and things are going really well for them now here is an entire bunch of people coming entering into their land and now they have been given legal authority to take back their their territory and they're going to have their own governor and they're going to have their own set of rules and uh, that is why there's an upset of balance of power in the region which is why there's a strong opposition when Zerubbabel comes back with his flock you know so um, initially they try to make a partnership uh, with the, with this new batch of people who have come back because you know then they can again have their set of uh, partnerships and understandings and move on you know so they that is the first attempt which they make we see that happening in Ezra chapter 4 verses uh, one to three and it's actually quite interesting because you know you'll get an idea of what exactly was going on why was there a position uh you know what are the things which were involved so um i mean uh, even as we are all online um yeah there's a question here i will answer that uh if if we could you know if we in the meantime if we can have just one person read aloud you know unmute yourself and read aloud ezra chapter four verses one to three if someone could read out, please. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as we you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Uh, verse three. But, but Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Okay, so, um, yeah, uh, the question here in the chat was that uh, the Temple of Solomon had been destroyed. And yes, it was very much destroyed because when the third time when Nebuchadnezzar comes, he's like really angry. He appointed a local person uh, as, as, the, as you know, to look after that area. Uh, but then, um, you know, he rebels. He wants to make a partnership with Egypt. So when Nebuchadnezzar gets to know that, he gets really angry against the advice of Jeremiah the prophet, these people, the leaders, they make a partnership with Egypt. Even though Jeremiah says, do not do such a thing. God wants you to be punished. So be humble, accept the punishment which is being given to you by the Babylonians. But these people say, no, 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 we can regain our power if we have an alliance with Egypt. And so they rebel. And when Nebuchadnezzar gets to know that, he comes down and he literally destroys Jerusalem. He wipes out the temple. So now it's like all gone. And uh, so now, uh, you know, the Lord is saying uh, a new temple would be rebuilt. And this would, in fact, be a better temple in the sense. Uh, it is this temple which will one day be the temple where Jesus will come. You know, so in that way, it's a temple of greater glory. Uh, so, yes. So the first temple, of course, was destroyed. And now they are making, uh, now they have to make plans for the second temple. Uh, coming back to this, um, you know, story that we were looking at. So Zerubbabel comes back over here and the locals think, no problem. A new set of people have come. Let's make a partnership with them and see how we can adjust. And so they approach him. And verse 25, um, uh, it, oh, okay, fine. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 is what we are looking at, right? Um, they say in verse 2, let us build with you. You know, we, we will partner with you in rebuilding this temple because we're all friends over here in this region. You know, uh, so, um, you, you know, we are willing to work along with you. And they say, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Ezerhaddon, king of Assyria. If you remember, the, uh, the international policy of the Assyrians was that they would pluck out the people from their region and they would put them somewhere else. They would take the people of another region, bring them here and put them over here. The idea was that they would they wanted everyone to forget their national identities completely and start looking at themselves as, uh, you know, people under Babylonian rule that way. So they wanted the people to forget their national identities. 
So Esser hath Don, king of Assyria, has taken these people from some region somewhere and brought them over here into the land of Israel and planted them over here in this place. And so these people are saying, from the time we came over here, you know, our ancestors came and landed up in this place, we have been seeking your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since that time. So, you know, we are familiar with your God and your uh, belief. So let us join with you in building, in rebuilding this temple. And then in verse 3, Zerubbabel and Joshua, they very clearly say, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel. So it is Zerubbabel and Joshua who reject the hand of friendship which is being given. Why did they do that? Because that is when all the clashes begin. All the oppos opposition uh, starts off. Um, yeah, so for that, we would have to look at a little bit of background. And it's very interesting background, actually. OK, it's too many verses. Uh, maybe we can look at some of the verses. Uh, Second Kings chapter 17, verses 24 to 41, is where you would get a little bit of very interesting background. Second Kings chapter 17, 24 to 41, um, where it says that the king of Assyria, he brings people from Babylon, Kuta, Eva, Hamath, uh, and Sefer Vaim. He brings people from those places and plants them over here in this uh, you know, Samaritan region, um, the Israelite region. Samaria, if you remember, was the capital of the northern kingdom. So he brings those, these outsiders and puts them over here. And it says in verse 25, uh, yeah, if we can have one person read out 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 25. It was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. OK, so um, they come over here with their heathen practices. And this used to once upon be a time where the Lord was worshipped, where Yahweh was honored. And so Yahweh uh, releases punishment among them. You know, And you have lions coming and killing off people. And the people panic. And this is the complaint that they send, um, verse 26, if someone can read out. Oh, come on, it's just a verse. You can definitely read it. Someone? So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the rituals of the Lord of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and indeed they are killing them, because they do not know the rituals of the God of the land. OK, so, so in verse 27, the king of Assyria, he says, OK, OK, we, we, we seem to have drawn the wrath of the gods of this land. And uh, lions are killing off people. And the people are very upset. You know, the whole idea of relocating people and putting them in different uh, in other places is so that they will be submissive and they'll submit to the Assyrian rule and all of that. But here, there's confusion happening. So the king says, fine, we'll get hold of some priests you know, who know about this whole Jewish thing, and we will send them back to the land. And they can train the people about uh, how this God who was there in this land up to now, how he should be worshipped, and what are the rituals they should follow so that the lions will stop troubling. And so it looks like as if they actually, the king actually sends back some of the Jewish priests to come back to the land and train these uh, foreigners on how to worship Yahweh. And we see that in verses 27 and 28. Then wow, it says in verse 28, then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But the really sad thing is that it says in verse 29, in verse 33, in verse 34, in verse 41, they start worshiping Yahweh. But it's a worship that is completely mixed up with their own religions. So they, you know, it's like um, this kind of um, mix and match which happens in some of our religions even today. They'll take one portion of uh, from one faith 
and they'll take another portion from another faith and they mix up these things and they and they say oh you know we are following this god but it's not really a true worship at all so this is what happens over here so when these people say from that time we have been worshiping your god and we have been making sacrifices to him so let us participate in the temple building what they are doing is what they are offering is something very dangerous if zerubbabel and joshua in the hope of winning their friendship if they had agreed to make a partnership with them the entire faith of israel would have just been wiped out and there would be no messiah to come down through the lineage so zerubbabel and joshua even though they anticipate that the backlash will be severe they plainly say no you may have no part of this we will do this ourselves and they are attempting to maintain the sanctity of the faith which has been handed over to them you know through moses and joshua and all of that they don't want to lose out on that and so they refuse to form a partnership with these people and now that these that these local leaders realize that they're not going to be able to make a partnership they think fine you know let's go for outright total violence and opposition and then let's see what this bunch of people will do because you know they're newcomers they've just come back they don't really have that much power or strength so it will be easy to crush them you know and force them to submit so which is why they change their strategy and uh, they begin to strongly discourage the people in their temple building attempts re temple rebuilding attempts so that, which is what we see in Ezra chapter 4 verses 4 to 5 um if we can have one person read out Ezra 4 4 to 5 please Show that you are here yeah, by reading out. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, so Ezra chapter 4, verse? 4 to 5. 4 to 5, right? Okay. Yeah. Then the people who had been living in the land tried to discourage and frighten the Jews and keep them from being build, uh, being building, from the building. Sorry. They also bribed Persian government officials to work against them. They kept on doing this throughout the region of Cyrus and into the region of the uh, reign of Darius. Okay, so um, there's a lot of opposition. They, in fact, hire counselors, it says. So, you know, they would have hired advisors, people who are like good in politics to figure out, you know, methods in, in how they can discourage the people from rebuilding, how they can keep them from growing stronger. So, this actual planned uh, a position that's you know now being unleashed and uh, so in the midst of all of that these people uh, try to start the construction work so I'm just saying things were not comfortable for them they were working under hostile situations and these are people who had power in their hands money in their hands and they even had locals in their hands so it they they were actually trying to rebuild in a very tense kind of uh, you know situation um, didn't Cyrus tell the people of Israel that they could build their temple? Most definitely he did. Why is it Zerubbabel uh, building and saying Ezra 4? Why is it building and saying Ezra 4, 3? No, I didn't. What does Ezra 4, 3 say? Yeah, you shall have no part of this. We talked about it just now. You probably lost your connection and you could not, you know. Um, we talked about all of this just now as to why he says you will not be part of it. And we looked at the background of that in um, Second Kings chapter 17. Uh, so we have gone through that. So later when we put up the video recording, you can actually uh, you know, go through it. You can catch up on those details. We talked about why they did not form a partnership. The, um, the rest of you who had your connection intact, you you caught the details, right? If anyone could, I hope all of you were able to follow. I mean, uh, did I lose my connection? No, right? My connection was intact. Okay, good. Because then you know you can always go back to the recording in case you missed out any details. You can you know catch it. Um, yeah, we have Sean raising his hand, but we know let's we we'll just look at another two three details and then we can get back to it. So um um. In Ezra chapter 4, verse, 
Maybe it's Ezra chapter. Just a minute, I'm trying to figure out the verse. Yes, Ezra chapter 3, verse 3. You know, if someone could, 3 and 4 maybe. Ezra chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, if someone could read out, please. Even though the returning of exiles were afraid of the people who were living in the land, they rebuilt the altar where it had stood before. Then they began once again to burn on it the regular morning and evening sacrifices. They celebrated the festival of shelters according to the regulations. Each day they offered the sacrifices required for that day. Yeah. So there's a lot of opposition. You know, and they, uh, later on we read somewhere in another one of the verses. Can't remember where. Okay, here only in this passage. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, so there's a lot of opposition going on. And in spite of that, it says so clearly, though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. So there was actual serious opposition going on. They, you know, they someone could easily come in the night and uh, attack them and they would be helpless uh, because Zerubbabel has come back as governor, but he's not really come back with any armed forces and all of that. You know, so they're in a very um, uh, vulnerable situation. And uh, now all the surrounding regions have become hostile towards them. So it says here, even though they were afraid, they decide we will at least build the altar first. You know, the entire temple will take time, but at least let the altar be set in place so that they can start making offerings to the Lord right away. So in, in, in the midst of the opposition, they build the altar on its basis. And every morning and evening, just as Moses had commanded, they restart the uh, sacrifices. Because every day you have to go before God and you have to admit that you are sinful. There's no way you can survive on your own. It's only by his grace and mercy that you know uh, he accepts the offering and chooses to forgive the people and consider them his people. So they, they immediately restart this important practice. And it also says in verse 4, that they restart the Feast of Tabernacles. They honor God by observing that festival. And uh, it verse 5, it says, they start uh, observing all the other appointed feasts of the Lord as well. And then in verse 7, it says that they even start placing orders for uh, the wood and then the carpenters who need to be hired for the for the temple and then all the you know provisions for all the laborers the food and the drink and the oil and they start um, um, ordering cedar logs all the way from um, lebanon so all of these things preparations they begin even though there's a lot of opposition that that is taking place um yeah, so we see all of that mentioned. It says in verse 7, they also gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre. Uh, okay, this is being given as payment. They're paying in the form of food, uh, which would have been like tons of food. I mean, not just some a little bit of food. So they're paying in the form of oil and food products. And uh, so they get cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa. That's basically because when the original um, temple had been built, Solomon's temple had been built, you know, these huge logs which needed to be brought uh, here to build the temple. At that time, what they had done was that in Second Chronicles 2.16, where it talks about how they made these wooden rafts, they would load the log on the rafts and they would set it afloat so it would come flowing all the way down to joppa where it would become easier for them to transfer it from joppa to the temple site so that's basically how they had done it in solomon's time and now they follow the same procedure again and they start bringing the logs they float it down the uh, the the waters and they bring it over here to joppa so all these preparations are going on and um it says in Ezra chapter 3, verse 8, that 14 months after returning back, now finally the work of the actual construction, the rebuilding, it begins. Okay, so that's in Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. Um, we had a person who had raised their hand. Yeah, if you can, you know, yeah, 
go ahead please uh ma'am i had a question over mm-hmm. here next to the fourth chapter third was the the rejected the uh, the people for uh, worshiping their god or the Israelites god but uh, if you see in like exodus and all when the Israelites came from egypt they had mm-hmm. some egyptians along with them who had uh, who had come with, uh, come with them from egypt mm-hmm. how were they allowed to like worship uh, god then yeah so um, when all this uh, plagues take place and uh, yahweh reveals his great power uh, and uh, you know the 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 god tells the israelites as you are leaving the land you know ask the locals for all their gold and all and their valuables they'll, they'll give it away because they are so scared of you all now that they will be more than willing to get rid of you so they collect all the jewelry and uh, with all the wealth and with that they start their exodus they leave the land and they start going towards the promised land and many of the locals who see that they think this is wonderful this yahweh is really powerful and so they also join with the crowd and that is why it says it says a mixed multitude you know if you look at the wording over there it says a mixed multitude started off from the land uh, because these people also wanted to be part of uh, of uh, following yahweh and the promise which yahweh has given to these people they also wanted to be part of it and we see throughout the old testament god is very open to anyone who is willing to come to him and to worship him but his condition is very simple you cannot have mixed worship you make your total 100% commitment to yahweh and you become a follower of yahweh yahweh is more than willing to accept you he accepted ruth ruth was a moabitess there were laws against the moabites they would not even that their descendants would not even step into the temple up to the 10th generation for the lord he canceled that rule for uh, for ruth's descendants because she had made a true commitment so the lord has no issues accepting any kind of gentile as long as the gentile makes a 100% commitment you know but what about these people in your uh, chapter 4 verse 3 we looked at the background of how they were what kind of worship they were doing in um, in in the in the in, in the in the in kings where we looked at the thing you know account it says again and again in many many verses second kings chapter 17 they followed the lord but they were also following their own rituals so that's the kind of worship that they were offering so no way would they be accepted so um even in that time early times when they whenever a uh, syncretistic worship a mixed a mixed kind of worship was um was cropping up god always came against it god always judged it so in the uh, so even back then uh, in the time of joshua god was not in favor of people who were doing mixed worship which is why joshua says are you willing to make a commitment as for me and my house we will follow the lord what do you want you make your decision so even back then god did not support people who were involved in mixed worship in the same way even now here he does not want these people to partner with those who are uh, you know indulging in mixed kind of worship so basically ezra chapter 3 verse 8 uh, we see that the um, the construction work begins and the foundation is laid okay so the building has not yet come up but the foundation is finally laid that we see in chapter 3 verses 10 to 13 and then when they look at the dimensions of the temple foundation you know but once you have the foundation laid the building will come up on top of that right and you can see the um, size the proportions of what the building is going to look like based on the dimensions of the foundation and it says in um, verses verse 12 chapter 3 verse 12 um uh, if we can if someone can read out ezra 3 verse 12 many of the older priests levites and heads of clans had seen the first temple and as they watched the foundation of this temple being laid they cried and wailed but the others who were over there shouted for joy okay so some of the very old timers i mean i really wonder they probably would have crossed 100 years 
you know, to still remember the previous temple. I mean, they had seen it with their own eyes, the previous temple. So I'm assuming that the proportions of this temple foundation was smaller in size than the other one. So when they look at this uh, foundation, which is laid, they cry. They think, oh my, how beautiful Solomon's temple was. And look at this. At that time, you know, they must have probably been little, little kids. And they still have memories of that temple. And they think, oh my, that was so big and grand. Now look at the foundation which has been laid over here. This is not so big. This is not that grand. And they cry. But the others who are, you know, who have gone through all these hostilities and still been able to establish that foundation, they are filled with joy and they say and they praise the Lord. So you have weeping and rejoicing taking place. And so basically you have the foundation being laid in chapter three. Now, there are many other details. Uh, we could not really look into them. We will, in fact, continue doing that because you know Hezra and Nehemiah were always considered as one single book because they're presenting one uh, reconstruction story You know where Jerusalem is being rebuilt, the temple is being rebuilt. So we will, uh, whatever we could not deal with today, we will look into those details next class as well. OK, so for now, because we, are, we have crossed the time limit, uh, we'll close very quickly with a word of prayer, please. Lord, we just thank you so much for some of the um, details that we could look at today. Uh, Lord, a lot of history takes place. A long time period is covered. I pray, oh Lord, that even as the students go through their textbook, they would kind of get a clear perspective of the timeline uh, so that we can understand these historical details accurately, oh Lord, because this is not... Um, myth. These are not just stories. These are historical events that took place a oh lot. So help us um, to get a clearer idea of the timeline and the, uh, the historically recorded rulers who ruled during this time. So that tomorrow, a oh lot, if someone were to, um, you know, um, uh, ask us to defend our faith, we will be able to clearly talk about how these things are all based in history. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus name. Amen. Thank you for being such patient listeners and for participating actively. Uh, so we'll meet again next week. Thank you.